competitive in Formula 3, but then something went wrong. So uh, simultaneously, you also got invited to drive one of their Formula 1 cars, which is a pretty amazing thing, and that was both good and bad for you. It was an unbelievable um, feeling for me it's, uh, to, to have wanted and dreamt about a moment for so long, and, and not many people get to live their dreams, and, and I'm still living it now, but uh, to be able to uh, set yourself a target and reach it, it was hugely um, rewarding and, and uh, something I'll never ever forget. What was the car like to drive? It was just um, mind-boggling, really. It, um, you know, I drove Formula 3 cars and I did some F3000 testing, which is like GP2. Um, so you, you drive a lot of fast things and you think you've got a pretty good understanding of what it's going to be like. And, and, um, but nothing even comes close to the amount of acceleration and braking that thing has. Cornering was about the same as the F3000 Formula 3 car, yeah. but the acceleration was just <laughs> really. <laughs> But as I alluded a few moments ago, it was a double-edged sword. So not only did you get the opportunity to drive a Formula One car and you were simultaneously in the JAG F3 program, but you had a crash. And that really hurt the championship for you in Formula Three and ultimately also hurt you deeply. Yeah, it, um, being the, the test driver, I got to test a lot of um, experimental stuff. So it was all through the, the phasing of, um, of traction controls and auto upshift and downshift and all the active diffs and, and um, the flexi wings and all that sort of stuff. So we had a lot of wing failures, um, you know, suspension failures and all that sort of stuff. And unfortunately, I was in the car for a lot of them. Um, and that incident you're talking about was in 2002. Um, was at Monza, one of the fastest, we're doing 200, oh, 370 something kilometers an hour. And I had a, a rear suspension failure. So it says the, the bottom wishbone broke off the back of the gearbox. So that in turn pulled the rear floor off the side pod, the rear wing, um, pulled the brake line out, obviously, because the wheels, the whole corner's ripped off. So then you don't have any brakes. So I still hit the wall doing 325 kilometers an hour. Um, then went backwards at 65. So it, uh, it was quite the impact. Um, I wasn't feeling too great after that. It was, uh, was all paralyzed on the right side of my body for a while and um, wasn't allowed to race for quite a lengthy period of time because a lot of swelling in my brain and, and bleeding on the brain, so uh, I had to go and get that checked a lot. And Michael Schumacher, I think, intervened in the middle of that accident. Uh, yeah, there was the first car on the scene, and they, uh, the f that's not the funny part about it, but the exact test the year before at Monza, he rolled at the first chicane, and I was the first car there. So it's, um, it's quite ironic that it uh, happened that way, but it's, um, yeah, something, something that uh, you could go without. And the damage effectively cost you the Formula 3 championship. And I think it really changed the course of your career. You missed the Formula 1 drive opportunity ultimately, which, as we all know, the team became Red Bull. Mark Webber went there and had great success. You then moved your focus to Japan, to a combination of Formula 3 and GT racing, a complete departure. Now you're in Asia, you're still a young guy and you're trying to forge a new international career. Uh, yeah, it was a good opportunity from those guys to go on and race in Japan. So Karis and I packed our bags and went off to Japan and, and yeah, won the Japanese F3 championship and, and uh, had an amazing time racing the big sports cars. And it probably gave me a little taste of what I'd missed, I suppose. You could run really close and lunge and pass and have really good on-track battles. So it really fired me up to um, to want to pursue you know, touring car racing. And, and ultimately, that's uh, from that moment, I was like, I want to come back. It's interesting though because again, um, you know, and I've had proximity to you over a long period of time, uh, you did want to get out of Japan, not for the racing sake, but for the lifestyle. And if I can reveal a little personal moment, you and I sat in... personal. <laughs> yeah, no, not too bad. We sat in a car together in Port Melbourne. There was an opportunity for you to continue either to go back to Europe and try for Formula One or for IndyCar, but it meant career debt and you actually burst into tears and you said, I want to come home. You'd had enough. Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty tough, I suppose, in that you know, I'd gotten close to the F1 dream where I was testing and, and racing and then went to Japan and, and um, had the experience of the tin top or the saloon style racing. And then, like you said, I could have gone and done, had a race seat in F1 that year that I came back here or gone to America and it wasn't that hard a decision in the end. But it was also about being at home. And that's what led you to supercar racing. Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten about um, about what life was like in Australia. I'd been gone, I think, 14 years. Um, left at such a young age, at 14, 15. 
come home every year at Christmas time and you know, see my mum and my son, my twin, which is not a lot of people know, so I have an exact replica of this, but in a female version. Um, I wanted to have a relationship with my family. Um, you know, Karis and I wanted to start a family, and um, this championship was just growing and exploding, so it, it was uh, definitely I'm getting all emotional here. What are you oh, doing here? Good. My first moment in supercars was uh, Sandown 500. You know, I realised that it was going to be a steep learning curve, um, but um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it, and, and um, you know, the racing was so intense. It was it was really good battles. So it was um, it was horrific welcoming, um, but um, obviously it all got a little bit better there. But yeah, the first couple of events weren't uh, weren't weren't that flash. Why didn't it work out with Stone Brothers? Onto the front straight at Queensland Woo! Raceway. He said it all himself. A breakthrough victory for James Courtney. You know, I got on really well with Ross and Jimmy and, and we, we won races, we, but the, the championship just never really seemed achievable for us when we were there. I think it, it um, was right when Triple Eight started you know, with their dominance, that's when they really kicked in and as a Ford team they were really probably the most dominant Ford team so it made our team sort of suffer. And then the next big opportunity with Dick Johnson Racing became a very big one that delivered a championship. So that was an incredible career high point and probably wouldn't get many more stressful moments than the back end of that year when you wrapped it all up at Sydney Olympic Park. Thank you, guys. Well done, James Courtney. A new V8 supercar champion is crowned here at Sydney Olympic Park. Yeah, that was a great period. We had a, a you know, very successful time. Like you said, there was a lot of... Um, but at trying times towards the end of that, that uh, championship year when we won with, with uh, Dick and Charlie at each other and, and, um, and you know, with the team not having enough money to finish and all those dramas that everyone knows so much about to, uh, to still keep our little core group of blokes together and focused on the end goal was, uh, was uh, pretty tough. And then ultimately off the back of that, now the opportunity with the Holden Racing Team, which we've touched on to some extent. And so what is it that you would like to continue to try and achieve now? Because you're getting to the upper echelon of races. You've done more than 350 of them now. You've won races, you've grabbed pole positions, you've been on the podium at Bathurst, but won a championship. You've still got a Bathurst victory that you can chase down. And I'm sure you'd like to put together another championship if you could. Yeah, it, it's, um, you know, I think it's an exciting era of you know, Walkinshaw Racing or Mobile One HSV Racing, where we are at the moment in, in um, I can sort of help mould and, and be a big part of the next phase of, of the team. You know, every year I get in the car, I'm enjoying it more and more, and, and um, you know, until I stop enjoying it, I won't, uh, I'll keep doing it. Oh! Ouch! All four wheels. James Courtney's car off the road at point of impact on the driver's side. You mentioned earlier in the in interview about hurting yourself. That's happened a couple of times for you. Uh, Formula One, we've covered off. Uh, but a weird one at Phillip Island where, again, you got hurt and you didn't walk away from that one. And then the most bizarre of all, it's Sydney Motorsport Park. I mean, have you walked under a ladder, black cats? What, what is it? What's going on there? I've definitely had a lot of exciting and, and trying times through my career, um, but yeah, I would not change any of them. I'd, I'd, if you said to me, hey, wind back 10 years, you can change some things along the way, yeah. what would you change? I wouldn't change anything. Right. I think, um, for me, I think everything happens for a reason. I think I'm a much better person because of the things that have happened to me. Yeah, I think everything happens for a reason. I think it's um, for sure. You know, being away from the car and you know, the championships that you missed out on would, would uh, ultimately be cool to have on your CV, but um, you know, I think I'm a better person for going through the crap that I've been through. Been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for your time today, mate. Good luck for the rest of the season. Cheers, mate. Thanks, James. Thanks.